everyone present here in the room and to all of our uh, viewers on our uh, faculty YouTube channel. So we are powered by YouTube. Uh, welcome to the lecture. Uh, today's lecture will be given by Professor George Contreras and it will be given on uh, a fascinating book, Genome Defense, a uh, recent publication uh, by Professor Contreras. Uh, I always have this feeling that I do not have to introduce George to our audience because I've uh, met so many times here and uh, George's publications and uh, Work is uh, well known to many people uh, in Poland and especially in the academic circles. Uh, but for our students and for our guests, uh, uh, George is, uh, uh, is a professor uh, at the University of Utah, graduate of Harvard Law School, is also a presidential scholar. Uh, uh, George has published uh, many topics. Uh, uh, Including standard development organizations, standard essential patents, uh, patent remedies, uh, and now uh, he works on many other topics. I've just named a few. Uh, today we'll uh, we'll have a chance to talk about his book on patenting genes. Uh, book is fascinating. There's a lot of layers to it. Uh, you will have a chance to. Uh, uh, to go behind the scenes of one of the most fascinating cases, uh, uh, recent cases, are, um, the, the Myriad case, uh, uh, on, on gene patenting. You will meet uh, fascinating people uh, uh, who have worked on this case, uh, together with the American Civil Liberties, uh, Civil Liberties Union. Uh, uh, so that's one layer uh, of meeting the people behind learn something about uh, how you prepare that case, how you find plaintiffs, defendants uh, for a case of that, uh, of that type. Uh, you will also learn a lot about the uh, American patent system and uh, uh, various players behind, uh, like the universities, uh, where the research is done, and the uh, universities that do license the, uh, license those gene patents in this particular case, uh, learn about uh, insurance companies, their policy, uh, but you will also learn about uh, people's stories, because in this case uh, it concerns uh, BRCA patent, BRCA genes, two genes, uh, the genes responsible for ovarian can uh, cancer and breast cancer. So uh, stories you might uh, Imagine are very moving, and this is also part of this. Uh, this is also part of this uh, excellent, uh, excellent book. Uh, we're very happy to have you, George. Uh, an honor, and the floor is yours. Uh, we will have George's lecture first. Then there will be time for questions, uh, both from the YouTube audience. We will probably read them out if possible, but also from the audience. Uh, uh, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. It's uh, a pleasure to be back here. It's always uh, nice. I've been uh, reflecting on this. I think it's been over 10 years since I met uh, Professor Sikorsky and have come here to Poznan for the first time. Uh, and again, it's always a pleasure to be back. So, so uh, with that wonderful introduction, I think you know what I'm here to talk about. This, this is a, a book, a, a project about patents. Right, and uh, just just so that we all are on the same level, I'll give you one minute on this. So a patent is is a right; it, it gives to its owner an exclusive right in the country where it's issued to exploit an invention, to make the invention, use it, to sell it for a long time, a period of twenty years from when application for the patent is filed. So file a patent application today, 2023, um, the patent is probably issued in a few years, but it will be 
good, it will give me exclusive rights, all the way until 2043. So it's a pretty long right. The case that we're talking about was a famous case in the United States, now 10 years old, um, went to the United States Supreme Court, and it was important, right? It had a big impact on the patent law, the doctrinal law of patents, both in the U.S., and it had an influence outside of the U.S., as we'll discuss. But the reason this case was interesting to me as an academic uh, is it had other issues as well, right? It brought in issues around access to health, medicine, scientific innovation, how we create things, what are the incentives to create new technologies, how the government makes its policy in these very important areas, and then things around the individual. This case relates to genetics. They all have genes. They all define really who we are at a physical level anyway, and also things about us, like our susceptibility to many diseases um, that will have a big impact in our life, and how we can know about this information contained within our bodies and the efforts that were made um, not too long ago to control our access to that information about ourselves. So even though there's a doctrinal issue, a statutory issue that's at the center of this case, these other issues surround it and are all affected by it. All right, so in the United States and, and most countries, including uh, all of the members of the TRIPS Agreement, the international treaty that relates to intellectual property, there are requirements to get a patent. Um, many requirements, the thing has to be a useful invention, it can't, it has to be novel, meaning it cannot have been invented before, uh, it cannot be obvious invention in view of what's already out there, the patent holder has to describe to the public how to make the thing, but most importantly, for this case, the invention has to be something that is proper subject matter for patent. You can't patent, for example, a poem, right, or a television show, a copyright, other forms of intellectual property, for not patents. So, what are the types of things that can be patented? In the U.S. Patent Act, the definition is a patent is available for any new and useful invention. So this includes four categories. Apparatus, these are machines, things that have moving parts generally, everything from your automobile to a smartphone to the better mousetrap. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Also processes, chemical processes, biochemical processes, making rubber, making a new uh, drug, all patentable, things that are manufactured, everything from bolts to shoes uh, to types of apparel, and most important for this discussion is the fourth category, composition of matter. So what is this? You can invent a new form of matter, a new substance, uh, maybe a new metallic alloy or a new carbon graphite fiber, a new, um, a new type of polyester. All of these things are new invented materials. And when you invent a new material, the patent that you get is very broad. This is a powerful type of patent, the most powerful type, because you control, as the owner of the patent, everything that you can make with this new material. So for example, uh, suppose that you invent a new type of plastic uh, you can make beverage containers from it, you can make housing insulation, you can make clothing, carpets, hundreds of different products can be made from this new plastic. Uh, but if you own the patent covering the plastic, nobody can make any of these different things without your permission, right? You have the exclusive right for 20 years in the country that issued the patent to use this new material. Okay. So this makes sense, I think it makes sense, uh, maybe you do as well, for a new plastic or metallic alloy um, or something like that. <coughs> of course, there are things that you find out in nature. Um, you cannot patent those materials. The wood uh, from an oak tree, useful, uh, you can make lots of stuff out of it, but can you patent it? No, 
because it's a product of nature. And in the United States, we have a doctrine that comes from case law, Supreme Court uh, cases, starting back in the 19th century, that says you cannot patent unmodified substance found in nature. And that includes inside the human body. So suppose you go out into the forest and you find a new type of plant. Um, you're the first person ever to discover this plant. So it's an amazing discovery. Uh, you also discover that if you rub the plant on your arm and it's burned, it will heal your burn. Um, so it has a use also. Now, healing the burn with the juice of this plant, that maybe, <coughs> maybe would deserve a patent. The plant itself, no. If you find other uses, somebody else finds other uses for the plant, you cannot stop them from making those uses because the plant itself, you cannot patent as a new composition of matter. You did not invent the thing. Um, and so even if you find that plant and you purify it, right, maybe you boil it or you remove the bugs and the twigs and the dirt from it, even then, it's still the natural compound. You cannot patent it. At some point, though, everything that people make comes from the natural elements, the periodic table of the elements. So at some point, there has to be a distinction between what we find in nature and what we make. And that, <coughs> that is the line between what you can patent and what you not. And the U.S. Supreme Court uh, has established in our country the test, and the test is not that different. In I'm maybe blocking this. Um, that in order to be patentable, this, this thing, this composition of, uh, of matter needs to be markedly different from the thing found in. Right? And of course, what does it mean to be markedly different? This is the uh, subject of many legal cases. One of the important cases for this discussion was a 1980 U.S. Supreme Court decision that considered whether a bacterium whose DNA had been modified by scientists was patentable as a composition of matter. This is a naturally occurring bacterium, but scientists figured out how to insert into its DNA a very small chain of additional DNA it made it attracted to petrocarbons, right, oil. And so they, just, they figured out how to use this bacterium to break down petrocarbons. So this is what happens when there's an oil spill, right, in the North Sea or the Gulf of Mexico. The helicopters fly over and they spray onto the oil this bacterium that breaks down the oil. This is a useful invention. Um, we still use this when there's an oil spill something similar to it. Um, and the court had to decide, well, but it's a living organism. Um, is it patentable? And this was a very controversial case in the 70s. And when the court decided in 1980, uh, it was a split decision, a 5-4 decision, right? Nine justices of the US Supreme Court. Five voted yes, you can patent this. Four voted no. Um, but the majority won. And ever since then, uh, you can patent a living organism, as long as it is modified in some way, different than the one you find. And so this is the precedent that we're dealing with now, in this case. <coughs> so, with this precedent from 1980, by the mid and late 1980s, science has advanced so that we can determine the sequence, the AT. EC, right, the, the nucleotide sequence of DNA in organisms, including in the human body, um, in a much bigger way than we could in the 70s. And this is when the Human Genome Project is proposed in the late 90s, map the entire genome of human species. But it takes a long time. Um, so at this point in the 80s, researchers are going gene by gene and identifying them. Now, can you get a patent on a new gene that you discover? Body. Well, clearly, when the gene is in your body, we have about 20,000 genes in our body. Every one of our cells, in the nucleus of our cells, we have all 20,000 of those genes. 
They are arranged on 23 chromosomes. These things in the middle here, uh, they look like a little X. Right, we have 23 of them. Um, and so, you know, it's maybe 1,000 genes are on each of these chromosomes. These chromosomes are big, long chains of DNA, millions of bases long, tens, hundreds of millions of bases long. So they're pretty big. If I find one gene, however, on the chromosome, identify it, and pull it out of the chromosome, take it out of the human body, and I have it in the laboratory, I reproduce it, make millions of copies in the laboratory, now I have something different, right? Something that does not exist inside the body. Inside the body, that gene is attached to millions of other pieces of DNA. In the laboratory, I have broken it away from the chromosome and all of the other DNA, and it is standing alone. It's isolated and purified. And the theory that lawyers advanced in the 80s was, okay, this isolated, purified gene, this does not exist in nature, right? This is something different. Um, and as a result, we should be able to get a patent. And the U.S. Patent Office agreed so that by the late 1980s, precedent was established in the Patent Office that you can patent an isolated human gene when it is not inside the body, but in the laboratory. And as you can imagine, this led to a lot of patents being issued on human genes as they were discovered. First genes that are discovered and sequenced are the ones that relate to diseases, right? Why is this? It's because to find these genes, scientists are able to look at families in which diseases appear to be hereditary. Unfortunate. In, you know, in some families, uh, everybody has blue eyes. In some families, everybody has black hair. In some families, many members of the family have a disease. And so if you take, look at the DNA of the people in that family, you can often identify what defects cause you to have the disease. So beginning again in the late 80s into the 1990s, many genes were found where specific defects, mutations, were linked to disease. And much of this work, this is just a very small sample of the list, uh, much of this work was done in research universities, both in the U.S. and uh, outside of the U.S. So by 2005, two researchers at MIT uh, counted all of these patents on genes and found that about 20% of the human genome, or known human genes, were covered by some kind of a lot, right? Okay, we'll come back to the one in red, the BRCA. Okay, well, some people thought this was a problem, but why didn't anybody do anything about this? There's several reasons. So opposition to this practice of patenting human genes did come from the bioethics field, right? But bioethicists, by and large, are philosophers, um, and many medical doctors and practitioners are outside of the mainstream of patent law. They really are not that involved in the patent system. Also, there was some litigation. Uh, this, uh, the, this person, Lori Andrews, is a law professor um, in Chicago uh, who challenged patents that Miami Children's Hospital held on a gene uh, that related to a childhood illness called Canavan's disease, a, a, a terrible illness affecting small number of children, a rare disease, um, but one that this hospital prevented clinics from testing for for free, uh, which they had done before. The patent enabled the hospital to charge for the testing and to prevent others from performing this testing. This litigation was unsuccessful. Um, it became clear that in the U.S. system, to mount a successful campaign of litigation, you need money and you need resources, and one law professor with some law student assistance not able to take on a large uh, multi-million dollar uh, research institution like Miami. Now, there was plenty of real litigation going on around gene patents. However, this litigation was between companies who fought about whether my gene patent is 
more powerful than yours, whether yours is invalid, maybe I, my scientist discovered something earlier that means your patent should not have been issued. Plenty of litigation, but none of the players, either in the patent bar, the lawyers, the patent office, or the companies or the institutions who had these patents, none of them had any desire to challenge the overall system of getting patents on these genes, because all of them benefited from having these patents. All right. So let's talk about a different organization, also outside of the patent intellectual property world, and that's the American Civil Liberties Union. You may have heard of this organization. They're quite old. They've been active in the U.S. for more than a century. Uh, they are civil liberties and civil rights nonprofit advocacy agency. Right? They bring litigation to challenge things like discrimination laws that are uh, discriminatory against people of different races, um, laws that attempt to establish a religion uh, in the public sector. This is uh, the case from the 1920s um, in Tennessee brought, uh, brought by the ACLU against the uh, school district in Tennessee that uh, outlawed the teaching of human evolution in the public schools. Right? They bring many cases um, opposing capital punishment, the death penalty, uh, which we do still have in many states in, in the United States. And most famously, they are uh, advocates for free speech. They are the, uh, the Voltaire of the modern world. They will fight for anyone's right to speak, even if the speech is itself abhorrent to them. They famous uh, back in you know, the mid-20th century for uh, defending the Ku Klux Klan um, and its ability to march in a parade uh, through a black neighborhood in Illinois. Um, obviously, you know, the ACLU very opposed to the sentiments of the Ku Klux Klan, nevertheless uh, successfully litigated and won the right for them to march um, because of their strong commitment. All right, so you may be thinking, what does any of this have to do with patents? And not, not so much. But here's what happened. <clears throat> ACLU, after the terrorist attacks of 2001, the ACLU became extremely active in the United States, uh, opposing things like the, uh, the Guantanamo detainee uh, situation, USA Patriot Act, which enabled surveillance on US citizens, um, all sorts of things. They, they raised awareness of civil liberties issues in the United States and raised a lot of money internally. So much that they could double the size of their national staff in New York. One of the people they hired um, as a result of this in 2003 was this lady, Tanya Simoncelli. Um, she is a science policy analyst. She was working out in Berkeley, California at this time. Um, was a graduate student, uh, had, had applied to get her PhD at MIT in Boston, but when she was getting ready to move to Boston to go to MIT, uh, a friend of hers pointed out an advertisement in a newspaper for a science advisor at the ACLU in New York. And first she said, well, you know, why do this? My bags are already packed for Boston. But her friend convinced her and she applied and it was such an exciting opportunity that she took it and went and became the first science advisor at the ACLU. And so why would a group devoted to civil liberties and civil rights need a science advisor? Well, it's because an increasing number of science issues were starting to have civil rights and civil liberties implications in the United States. Things like brain scans, you know, could, you, could the police start to use these functional magnetic resonance imaging scans to show if someone was lying or if they were guilty of some crime? I mean, this may seem far effect, but this was a real theory. The police thought this was a great new avenue that they had. Um, DNA databases, the FBI in the United States has collected the DNA of everyone who's arrested. Whether or not you're charged with a crime, you're arrested. Your DNA is in this large database now. And there are civil liberties issues associated with that. Also genetic discrimination. 
um, employers, insurance companies starting to think about whether they should deny coverage or not hire someone who has a genetic, uh, maybe a risk of getting a disease down the road if you're an insurance company. It's pretty good sense, right? Why insure someone who's going to get an expensive disease? We don't have nationalized health care in the United States, right? This is a private business, um, its own separate problem. Uh, but these are all civil liberties issues that the ACLU started to become interested in um, at the prompting of this uh, science. So another issue that she brought to the attention of the ACLU was gene patenting, issues around the patenting of genes. Again, in the bioethics community, they were there for some time, and science policy analysts knew about these issues. Uh, but it did seem somewhat far-fetched. And so when Tanya Simoncelli approaches this guy, Chris Hansen, who's a very senior litigator at the ACLU, one of the guys who uh, was involved in the Brown versus Board of Education uh, litigation, school desegregation, he went to the Supreme Court successfully to strike down the, uh, uh, well, the Communications Decency Act, the ban on online pornography, which again, you might not think is a great idea, but um, you know, in the free speech area, that's speech. Um, and so he was very well known, been at the ACLU 30 years, and uh, Simoncelli would go to him to bounce ideas about what new projects they could undertake. And when she told him about gene patenting, he said to her, no, 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 this, this, isn't, this can't be right. You must have made a mistake. No, you can't patent a human gene. That's impossible. Um, and of course, you know, she very persistently goes back to her office and sends him some articles like showing that this is actually happening, and it has been for years, and he's amazed. He, he can't believe it, because intuitively, he feels, this is crazy. How can you do this? And then, of course, as a good litigator, the second thought he has is, well, who can we sue? Uh, this is what the ACLU does. Um, again, the ACLU is a litigating organization. We don't lobby Congress, right? We don't uh, propose administrative regulations. We go to court. And so is there a way to address this issue in a lawsuit? Um, and this is a question that they started to think about in 2005. And it took them a long time to think about it, right? So in the US, impact litigation, this is what people like the ACLU do. And it is different. It is a different form of policy advocacy than administrative reform, regulatory, or even legislative policy making. Right? With litigation, the decision maker is not a bureaucrat, it is not a Congress, a legislator, it is a judge, or in many cases in the US, a jury. Uh, civil cases in the US are still tried to a jury um, if there's a question of fact that needs to be. So that's a big difference. Additionally, to affect policy change through litigation, litigation, the court system exists to resolve disputes between parties. It resolves cases, not policy questions, right? You can say, you know, I think it's a bad idea to patent genes. Well, you can take that complaint to Congress. And if Congress agrees with you, they can pass a law amend our patent act to say, okay, no more patents on G. That's a legislative approach. With litigation, you actually have to bring a lawsuit against somebody, um, and you know, so you need a plaintiff, someone who's injured, you need a defendant uh, who did the harm, you need a harm, right? You need to prove that there was some injury, and you need a remedy. The plaintiffs have to ask for some particular Remedy for them, right? Not for society, uh, but for them to address their harm. About litigation is in the common law system, decisions by courts have precedential effect, right? On everyone who is subject to the jurisdiction of that. So if, for example, you're at the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, uh, which is covers you know Pennsylvania and New Jersey, uh, and that court reaches a decision, then everyone within Pennsylvania, New Jersey, is bound by that. If 
here at the United States Supreme Court than the entire country. So it has the effect of a law. Um, it has the effect of a congressional enactment. However, instead of 500 people debating and voting on this thing, you have nine people at the Supreme Court, three people at an appeals court, or just one person um, at the district. So powerful, but also challenging way to affect policy. Could the ACLU do this with Gene Patenting? Good question. The first thing they have to do, however, is pick a defendant, right? If they're going to mount a challenge to Gene Patenting, they have to find some patent that caused harm. Patent on and the list is very long, right? By this time, 2005, again, 20% of the genes are, are patented. That's a thousand genes um, and a thousand, well, many thousands of. So, how do you pick um, your case? Well, it's a lengthy process. And if you look down this list, you know, you'll see that many of the, uh, the, the disease, the genes here that relate to different diseases, they're the rare diseases, right? If you're like me, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, you look down this list and say, okay, Alzheimer's disease, I, I've heard of that. Canavan disease, I don't know what that is. Cystic fibrosis, I, that's a rare disease, but I've heard of it. Cancer, we'll skip that, you know, but hemochromatosis, I don't know what that is. Long QT syndrome, many of these diseases are rare. And there's a reason for this, right? The hereditary diseases, often they, they are rare diseases. Um, there are many of these diseases that are fatal. Long QT syndrome, for example, fatal childhood disease. Um, children die as a result of it. And some people in the ACLU thought this was a good uh, target. But at the senior levels, the senior litigators realized, no, to mount a full sort of civil liberties public interest lawsuit, we need to pick a disease that is prevalent and a disease that everyone has heard of. And of course, I've highlighted it for you already. Breast cancer is that because we have two genes, BRCA1 and 2, which I'll talk about in a bit more, um, that are highly associated with hereditary breast cancer. They are discovered by researchers at the University of Utah, um, which has discovered many of these genes in the, uh, the golden age of the gene hunters. Uh, which is in really the late 1980s, early 1990s. Some universities uh, really got into this business of discovering new genes. And I can discuss why if you're interested. Um, and Utah and uh, Michigan and, and uh, you know, Johns Hopkins, a number of them had lots of these genes, lots of patents on the genes. Why breast cancer? Of course. Um, the number one disease in the United States in terms of advocacy, in terms of fundraising, and really in terms of public awareness. I you know, estimate that in the United States, everyone in the country is affected in some way by breast cancer. Uh, even if they don't have it, um, some relative or a friend has had it, they know someone, it's in the news, famous people have it. Supreme Court justices had Sandra Day O'Connor um, had breast cancer. Um, so thinking ahead, way down the road to how this case might go, this is a disease that would take this case from being a technical, patent law doctrinal case to a case that involves some health element that affects everyone in the country, including judges. Breast cancer also has the dubious advantage of making this a women's rights issue. So with the ACLU, uh, there are different groups, right? There are people who focus on free speech, people who focus on uh, you know, race discrimination. Um, there's a women's rights group, which is very powerful, founded in fact by Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, as one of her first jobs out of law school. Uh, she went to the ACLU in New York. Um, this now is one of the more powerful groups within the ACLU and Chris Hansen's bringing this case to the women's rights um, organization at ACLU, got a strong ally within the organization to bring this case. <clears throat> because it wasn't clear 
at the beginning that the ACLU should bring this case. Number one, they never brought a patent case. In 100 years, they had never brought a patent law case. Number two, none of them were patent lawyers. Right? These all, they have top credentials. They all went to top law schools, the best grades, brilliant people. But they're civil rights lawyers, constitutional lawyers, patent law. For those of you who are studying it, you know, a highly technical field. Um, lots of scientists and engineers in this field, not generally the kind of people who go uh, to work in the agency. They finally, so they needed to develop support. And this process took four years um, for them between the day Tanya Simoncelli walks to Chris Hansen's office and the day they file suit, four years. So it took them a long time to decide they even wanted to do this. Having the Women's Rights Project on their side was very important. And, and this woman on the right, Sandra Park, became one of the key players in this case. Um, and to this day, today, she continues to work. <coughs> All right. Well, let's think a little bit about this. <coughs> Who held these patents? So, breast cancer. Uh, this disease has been known for centuries. Uh, by the 19th century, doctors observed that this disease appears with much higher than average frequency in some families. <clears throat> this is uh, Paul Broca, the, um, and if you ever studied medicine, uh, region of the brain, called uh, Broca's region, uh, which affects uh, language and cognition. Um, his wife's family was one of these families affected by breast cancer. Half of the women in this family developed this disease. He knew there was something hereditary about the family that made this happen. But of course, this was long before DNA was discovered or we knew anything about it. So by the 80s, by the time we actually had the technology needed to sequence DNA, one of the first targets was breast cancer, which had been, you know, this, this disease that everybody knew had to have some genetic basis, um, but we didn't know what it was. So uh, groups throughout the world began to look at families with breast cancer, high prevalence of breast cancer, and start to sequence their DNA, see if they could find some common defects that ran in these families. And the breakthrough came in 1990 by Mary Claire King, who was a researcher at Berkeley, um, who had spent a decade collecting records from these families, interviewing families, um, figuring out and, and associating through something called linkage analysis, breast cancer with other physical traits and other diseases whose genetic origin was known. And through this mathematical process, a statistical analysis, she was able to prove that there was a gene responsible for breast cancer in something like 5% of families, and that it must be somewhere on chromosome number 17, right? Remember, the chromosomes look like an X, and it's somewhere on the long part of chromosome 17. But that's as far as mathematical analysis would get her. The next step, of course, is what's called the wet laboratory. This is where you actually get the blood samples and sequence the DNA. And when she made her announcement in 1990, this triggered an international race among research groups in the US, Canada, Germany, Japan, to find this gene, right? This was one of the biggest scientific races of the 1990s. And there are a couple of books already written about this race, uh, which I commend to you. That's not my book. My book starts after this. Here are the people uh, who won the race, right? So this guy on the right, Mark Skolnick, He's a researcher at the University of Utah. He's a genetic epidemiologist. He thinks, yes, the breast cancer gene. This is, you know, the brass ring at the end of this genetic hunting race. We need to find it. He teams up with Wally Gilbert, uh, who was a Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist at Harvard, uh, the founder of Biogen, one of the first biotech companies um, that uh, had mixed success, but uh, still very important, and a venture capitalist from Salt Lake City named Peter Meldrum. And they form a company. Unlike the other teams that are racing to find this gene, they've got a university affiliation. This is University of 
uh, and the Murray Head offices on campus in our research park. Um, but unlike the other teams, they have money. Uh, they have venture capital funding. They have funding from the Eli Lilly Corporation, a big pharmaceutical company. And they also take money from the National Institute of Health in the US. And with this money and sequencing technology that Lilly is able to uh, provide for them, they win the race. Um, four years later, uh, Myriad and its collaborators successfully clone uh, the BRCA1 gene. They prove that this is the gene with certain defects causes the breast cancer in uh, these particular families. And immediately, they file a patent application on that gene as a composition of matter, right? So that they will own the patent on the gene and any use of the gene, whether it's to diagnose breast cancer or to make a drug or to make a diagnostic kit, anything you like, um, with that gene, they will own it. Okay, but that's not how it started. So in 1994, they're scientists, right? And so they do what scientists typically do. They publish the result in the leading scientific journal. Um, and this is a breakthrough, right? So immediately clinics, genetic clinics, start screening patients for the mutations that Myriad has revealed. And by 1996, the University of Pennsylvania is screening 500 patients per year um, using this information. That same year, Myriad begins to offer a commercial test for these genetic defects. And they realize, well, you know, we're now competing with these universities who are using the information that they gave out for free um, to run this test. And these 500 patients who Pennsylvania is screening, they're not buying our test. So what's with that? Um, the patent issues in 1997. And soon after that, Myriad starts to enforce the patent against clinics around the country for performing BRCA testing. So University of Pennsylvania is first, but others follow Georgetown, the National Cancer Institute, um, Yale University. And so by 2001, all of these other clinics are shut down, and Myriad is the only provider of screening for BRCA genes in the United States. There's, I didn't tell you, there's a BRCA1, there's another gene, BRCA2, uh, which they are also the first to discover. For BRCA2, they beat a lab in Cambridge, England, um, by one day, one day, they filed their patent application, and the next day, um, the Cambridge group's uh, paper appears in Nature. Um, but that's one day too late. Uh, the patent goes to, uh, to Myriad. So um, they're quite smart about their patent filing strategy. If you're studying to be a patent attorney, you're, you should pay attention to what these guys did. Uh, because it was very smart business, it had its other drawbacks. So, 2001, you're the only show in town. What's wrong with this? This is what patents are for, right? Um, so there were some ethical complaints that were raised against practice. First, the test is expensive. Um, a little over $3,000. You know, this is 1997, dollars so uh, it's more expensive uh, as time goes on. What's wrong with this? Um, you know, you go to the doctor, you get a cholesterol test, blood sugar level, these usual tests, they're pretty cheap. Um, you know, again, if you have a national healthcare system, you never see these costs, but we do um, in the United States. It's $50, $75. Um, most of our insurance covers these ordinary tests. This test, which probably costs $200 for the company to run, you know, they, they make a very nice profit um, by charging over $3,000. And the insurance industry in the US does not cover these tests, at least at first. Many reasons why not. Um, number one, the patients who are getting this test, maybe you're you know, a 20 year old woman and you say, you know, my, my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, they all got breast cancer. Um, I should get this test to see if I carry this genetic mutation. And you would be absolutely right in wanting this test. But 
you know, a 20 year woman, you're, you're, you're healthy, right? And insurance companies generally don't like to pay for expensive tests for people who are healthy, right? If you have this genetic mutation, and heaven forbid, you do get breast cancer. And by the way, if you have one of these BRCA mutations, as a woman, you have an 80% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Right? So it's pretty sure that you will get breast cancer um, if you live a natural lifespan. Nevertheless, if you're an insurance company, you have other views, right? You think, well, okay, maybe you're the lucky 20%, so why am I wasting my three? Or maybe uh, we pay $3,000 for your expensive test and you get hit by a bus coming out of the doctor's office, so then we just waste our money. Um, or even worse, and again, I come from a national system, a country that has good health protection, uh, you, you don't appreciate all of these issues. But our health insurance coverage comes often from our employer or our spouse's employer. So my university has very good health coverage. Um, but if I leave my university and go work for a law firm, you know, that law firm will then cover me and, and, and my wife and our children, if we have children. Um, so why would the health insurance company that covers me at 20, um, want to pay for a test to cover a disease that I might get 15, 20 years later when somebody else is covering me, right? Why, why bother to do that? And even worse, what happens if I get a positive result on this test? Well, the standard of care, if you have one of these positive results, a BRCA, a deleterious BRCA mutation, that means you're going to get breast or ovarian cancer at a very high likelihood. The standard of care in the United States today is surgery, prophylactic surgery, removal of the breast tissue or the, uh, the ovaries and the fallopian tubes um, that are likely to become, um, are likely to get tumors. And that's an expensive surgery. Um, and so if I'm the insurance company, I'm thinking, okay, I paid $3,000 for the test. If you have the positive mutation, then I'm going to pay $80,000, $100,000 for this surgery, all for someone who isn't yet sick. So again, the insurance companies have a very good story why they don't cover the test. And Myriad spent a decade negotiating with insurance companies to cover the test. But certainly in the early days, we didn't. And this meant that many women could not get tested. And they didn't, um, even though they should have. All right. That's the price. Second thing, remember, if you get the Myriad test and you have a positive result, fairly radical surgery is what you should do. But you can't get a second opinion, right? Usually, if you're going looking at a serious surgery, you will go to a second doctor, at least get a second opinion. You can't do that, at least not in the United States, <coughs> because there's only one company that offers. Another thing, that relates to the patent monopoly is a monopolist doesn't have much incentive to improve its product during the life of its monopoly. Because it has no competition. Um, you can't say, well, that guy's offering a better test, I'll go get his test. <coughs> Unless you are rich enough to go to another country um, and get a test, you can't do it. And so, <coughs> excuse me, there, were, there was strong evidence that there were certain mutations that existed in people um, that were not covered by the Myriad test. People begged Myriad to add this to their standard test. And they finally did. They, they created an optional add-in um, for another $700. You could uh, you know, pay to get the extra, um, the side order with your regular test. So that was so-so. But in the early days, that, that didn't even. Researchers, uh, Myriad did allow academic researchers to do research on the BRCA genes. They benefited from this research because researchers publish their results. Myriad can add the new discoveries to their test if they want to. Um, but if a researcher finds, you know, a researcher, they, they take recruits, human subjects, for their, uh, their research project, they may find in some people the deleterious mutations, but they can't tell those people. Um, the researchers know that that person is likely to get cancer, but the person cannot find out unless they go by the Myriad test. 
um, even though the researchers already did the test on them. So this was viewed as problematic. And then, because of this, researchers didn't like this situation. So researchers were dissuaded from doing research on this gene or other genes that were covered by patents. And then finally, science advanced over the 1990s. And, and we discovered that more and more diseases are not caused by, by one uh, gene or one genetic defect, right? Those so-called Mendelian diseases, right, after Gregor Mendel, uh, like Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis that are caused by one genetic defect are quite rare. Most common diseases, arthritis or asthma or diabetes, they're caused by a complex of genetic interactions. 10, 20 or more genes can interact in some way. But if your test for those defects it can't include all the patented genes, then your test isn't very good, right? So there were complaints there. A lot of ethical complaints, but as you see from this list, none of these are complaints that relate to patent law. They all relate to the effects of this patent on patients and society. So that's a problem from a litigation. Nevertheless, the ACLU proceeds. And one of the things they're very good at in their civil liberties litigation is finding plaintiffs, right? The way the litigation rules work in the United States, it, this used to be possible in the past, but the ACLU does not represent itself. It is a law firm a public interest law firm. They need plaintiffs, people who are injured by whatever the practice is that they're challenging. And so who's injured by these patents? Well, you have scientists like uh, Wendy Chung here in the, the left corner, right? She's a geneticist. She cannot run these tests. This affects her, her livelihood, her research career. There's a lot that she can't do. It affects genetic counselors, like this lady uh, uh, above her. These are people whose job is to advise patients about their genetic risks. Can't get the information to tell them about their risks. She can't do her job. You've got advocacy organizations like Breast Cancer Action, um, which advocates for uh, health reform uh, for breast cancer patients. You've got, you've got publishers um, like the Boston Women's Health Collective. These are the people who in the 1970s published the revolutionary book, Our Bodies, Ourselves, the first book about women's health, um, at least in the United States, possibly anywhere. Um, and then you've got patients. So the ACLU recruited six women who all had cancer, all should have been tested for this genetic mutation, but none of them could be tested, either because they were poor, they were on Medicaid, they wouldn't cover the test, or they had one of the defects that wasn't in the Myriad test, so they didn't, they didn't qualify, um, so for one reason or another. So we have 20 plaintiffs that they assemble to bring this lawsuit. Um, now, in doing this, another thing that the ACLU is the master of is weighing public opinion. And so they mounted a media campaign in advance of their lawsuit that is really unprecedented certainly in the world of patent law, right? Uh, we don't, you know, patent law, you can read some blogs, you can read Law 360 or Bloomberg, you can get some information if you're an expert. But for the general public, there's very little information. These people, they had a full episode on 60 Minutes, which, you know, at the time was the, the, the leading news program in the United States. They are in the New York Times, the Today Show, lots of media attention. And so, in 2009, four years after this began, they file a complaint in the district court in New York um, seeking to invalidate uh, the 15 claims of seven patents on the BRCA gene held by them. So the reaction was immediate, right? The reaction from the patent law community was astonishment. So I was in this community. You know, I, I knew about Myriad's patents. I followed the story of these patents for, for years. And I was quite surprised, along with everybody who I knew who studied this. Um, I was surprised in a good way. I thought, good for them. I never, never would have occurred to me to bring this lawsuit, but go for it. Um, but the patent bar was outraged. Uh, because remember, by this time, by 2009, the patent office 
have been issuing these patents since the 80s, right? More than two decades worth of precedent, patent office practice, literally an entire generation of patent lawyers. Like you were, you could be born like when that Chakrabarty case was coming out, and now you're a patent lawyer, um, and for your entire life, the patent office has been allowing patents on human genes. So it seems ridiculous to challenge this well-understood practice. It's what we call black letter law, that you could do this. And so the patent blogosphere blows up. Um, I don't know, if, if, if you're interested in patent law, you should follow the bloggers because it's highly entertaining. Um, and you also get some current news every now and then. Uh, but the bloggers went crazy. They said, these ACLU people, they don't know anything. They don't know what they're doing. This is a frivolous lawsuit. They should actually be disbarred, you know, for their legal license should be revoked because this suit is so ridiculous and frivolous. Well, that, eventually they changed their uh, reaction. Um, but this was the initial thought from the bar. Okay, so what happens? Hang on, I'll, um, I, uh, uh, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, so we, we go through this the rest relatively quickly. Um, in the U.S., you start at a district court, right? The court in the Southern District of New York, which is, what, like two subway stops from the ACLU office is where they choose to the file. Uh, but it's also a very important court. It's called the Mother Court in the United States. This court existed before the U.S. Supreme Court in American history. Um, this judge, Robert Sweet, was on the court for a long time. He was 88 years old uh, when this case was randomly assigned to him. This is uh, uh, this guy himself is worth uh, biography. Um, he was friends with uh, Justice Sotomayor. She came from this court um, as well. He is most famous for being the judge that earlier dismissed the case against McDonald's Corporation. So you may remember that a, a group of uh, overweight teenagers sued McDonald's Corporation for causing their obesity um, as, a, sort of, as a medical health risk case. He dismissed this case saying they, they knew the risks when they ordered that third Big Mac. They understood what um, and so, But he became quite famous for this. And he liked science. He liked science related. But his real secret weapon here was his law clerk this year. So I, I think you don't have this system here in Poland. But in the United States, um, after we graduate from law school and receive our JD degree, many, like, many good students, right, the, sort of the top students, will work for one year or two years for a judge as their assistant. Um, and uh, federal district court is a prestigious court, right? Uh, appeals court is more, and uh, after you do this, if you're really, really good, you can apply to be a clerk in the U.S. Supreme Court, and this is kind of the pinnacle of the, um, you know, legal training. Anyway, the guy, one of the two clerks of Judge Sweet this year was a guy, Herman Yu. He had uh, recently graduated from NYU Law School. And the thing that most people didn't realize is, simply by chance, his undergraduate degree was in molecular virology. So in the United States, law is a graduate degree, right? We have four years of undergraduate education. We get a bachelor's degree in Anything, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be law. There is no undergraduate degree in law. Um, we have a degree in my, I have a degree in electrical engineering and English literature is my undergraduate education. Did not prepare me at all for law school, but that's okay. We have then three years of law school uh, when we get our JD degree. So this guy was a scientist. Um, and then he went to law school, had his law degree, clerked for this judge. And this was an amazing and very fortunate coincidence. Because in all of his years on the bench, um, Judge, Judge Sweet never had a PhD in science as one of his clerks. But it happened this year, and the case was randomly assigned to Judge Sweet. And so they develop a theory about this case. And the theory is this. What is DNA? Well, DNA, of course, is a chemical. The molecule that exists inside of our bodies. Um, but it's Primary use is as a carrier of information, right? You see A, T, G, C, right? Those nucleotides, they code proteins. The proteins that they produce 
go out into our bodies. They do all sorts. Of, all of the cellular functions of our bodies are the result of these proteins that are coded by DNA. The BRCA genes code proteins that are tumor suppressors. If they're broken, then the tumor suppressors are not working, and tumors grow rapidly. Okay, this is why uh, they're so important. Now, the information content of the gene inside of your cell and outside of your cell, it's exactly the same, right? And so their theory is, if you think about DNA as an information carrier, um, it doesn't matter whether the DNA is inside of your body or outside in the laboratory, isolated and purified. It's the same DNA. The sequence information is exactly the same. Therefore, it is a product of nature. Even if it's outside of your body, even if it's purified and isolated, and there should be no patent. And so Judge Sweet at the district court invalidates all 15 of the patent claims that were challenged in Myriad Health. So this was a big victory for the ACLU team. But of course, it's only the first step in the process because, of course, Myriad appeals this case. And in the US, all patent cases are appealed to one court called the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, if you are interested in specialized courts, whether we should have specialized courts or not, there's a vast amount of literature analyzing this Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Most of it unfavorable, <laughs> um, but for better or for worse, these are the guys and, and women uh, who hear all the patent appeals in the US. And many of them, because they hear the patent appeals, they know something about patents. How do you know something about patents? Well, usually by being a patent lawyer. So there are quite a few patent lawyers on this court, and patent lawyers generally like patents. So the general plant of this court is usually pro. All right, so something else very interesting happens at this stage of this litigation, which is also interesting um, for those who are not from the United States and how this happened. So litigation, this happens in the judicial branch of government. Right? Um, you have a private party sues another private party before the court. These other parts of the government, the executive branch, the White House, and the hundreds of agencies and offices and bureaus of the executive branch of government, they're not really part of this litigation. I mean, sometimes agencies are, but, but in most in private civil cases, the federal government is not a party. But they could intervene in some way. So remember the patent office. The patent office is right here, USPTO. They issued these patents. They're quite interested in what happens. For 25 years, they have been issuing patents on genes. They like to do this, and they think they were right. So if they want to intervene, they have to request the Solicitor General, who is the third ranking lawyer in the United States government, to intervene on their behalf in this case. So the patent office asks the Solicitor General to make an appearance on their behalf. And if he wants to, the Solicitor General can then intervene in a private litigation. So that's what happened here. Uh, the USPTO, this is David Capos, director of the USPTO at this time, thought we should defend our patents. Why is the ACLU attacking these patents that you know, were perfectly legal that were well-established precedent. He asked the Solicitor General, this guy, um, the lower left, uh, Neil Katyal, to argue at the Federal Circuit that the patents are good. Um, and this argument from the Solicitor General is usually quite persuasive. Courts give great deference. It's, it's like the Advocate General, right, in, in, in the European Union. Quite deferential. However, not everybody in the Obama administration thought these patents were a great idea. And the biggest opponent, the most vocal opponent of the patents was this guy on the left, Francis Collins, who, you know, I have, this is a casual picture of him. Um, he's director of the National Institutes of Health. He directs the $40 billion uh, research budget that the National Institutes of Health distributes to academic institutions around the country to do my biomedical research. But he has an illustrious history 
um, and background. He was first, before this, the, uh, the head of the U.S. branch of the Human Genome Project, um, another great scientific race of the late 90s and early 2000s. And before that, he was at University of Michigan. He led the research team that discovered the CFTR gene responsible for cystic fibrosis. And what did the University of Michigan do with that gene? Did they license it to a company like Myriad, like University of Utah did, that could then exclusively control the market for cystic fibrosis testing? No. University of Michigan did get a patent. All of the universities get patents on it. All of them. Um, Michigan, though, they said, with our patent, anybody can use it. Um, for a modest fee, you know, we'll let anybody run tests for cystic fibrosis, and they did. And this was his idea. Um, and so now, he is the head of NIH, and hears about this plan that the patent office has to intervene in this case. And he assembles a coalition of other agencies within the executive branch to oppose the patent office. And one of the fascinating things I found about researching this book was, was digging into this fight within the Obama White House between all of these agencies as to what position the executive branch would take in this case. And you have two large groups, so the Patent Office, Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, which of course is patenting all of these seeds and plants and animals. Um, they're on one side, and then NIH, um, and all of these other, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Economic Council, lots of other agencies are against it. And so what does Neil Katyal do as Solicitor General? Well, he comes up with a compromise. His compromise is the following. Okay, here's a gene. PRCA gene has something like 80,000 of these nucleotides, ATGC. Only 6,000 or so oops, are what we call exons, right? The exons are the ones that code the protein. Um, in between the 6,000, and so color's not so great. The pink, the pink are the exons, the green are the DNA in between the exons, we call them introns. The introns, we don't know what they do, right? They do something, they must do something, but we still don't really know exactly. Um, the ones that code the proteins are the exons. So, out there in nature, in your cell, the exons and the introns are all mixed up together in the gene. You could, and some companies do, they just take out the exons from the 80,000 base gene, you narrow it down to only 6,000, and that's only the exons. We call that a complementary cDNA construct, and you use it. You use it in drug development. Um, and so people do that. And so the theory of the Solicitor General is, okay, well, maybe when all of the nucleotides are appearing in the gene in the body, that should not be patentable, because that does occur in nature, sort of adopting the view of Judge Sweet in this report. But if you did this other thing on the bottom, you just take out only the exons, make the separate DNA construct, maybe that should be bad. All right, this is the government. So we have ACLU says, no, no none of it should be patentable. Myriad says, everything should be patentable. The PTO says, is with Myriad. But in the middle, you've got the Solicitor General that says, oh, some of it patentable, some of it not patentable. What does the, uh, the court do? This is Alan Lurie, he was the head of the three-judge panel at the Federal Circuit who heard this case. Former patent lawyer at large pharmaceutical company, uh, a PhD in chemistry um, before joining the bench. And, and he says, okay, this theory about DNA as an information carrier, ATGC, no, that's not what DNA is, forget it. Remember, this guy is a chemist. He's not a geneticist, he's a chemist. Um, again, who gets his PhD in the 60s. So before we really, you know, this is when Watson and Crick were still like doing their experiments. He, he, he's not with the genetic thing, he's a chemist. To a chemist, forget about ATGC. This is what DNA looks like. It's a molecule, right? Something that you can build, you know, with those little blocks um, that you had in high school, uh, the, the balls and the sticks. And what happens when you extract the gene from the longer DNA, you break covalent bonds in the chemistry, you, you create a different molecule. The 
molecule of the isolated gene is different than the molecule of the cellular gene. And just so you think, like, I'm, I'm not very artistic, this diagram is from the, the, the Court of Appeals opinion. It's actually an illustration from the opinion of the Court of Appeals. Um, and so, not surprisingly, they uphold patents. Right? Reverse Judge Sweet, they uphold the patents. And so now we're onward to the Supreme Court. Um, and again, this is a very long story, a long saga. I won't uh, cover all of it. But you should know that at this point, um, it's attracted attention from the advocacy community. Breast Cancer Action, who is one of the plaintiffs, has organized demonstrations on the steps of the Supreme Court. The news vans are there. I mean, this is, you know, this is, for, for a patent case, this is totally out of the ordinary, right? Usually, nobody shows up except, you know, some industry lobbyists and some law professors who are, you know, not teaching a class at this time. This is people sleeping out on the steps of the court overnight so that they can get a seat to hear the oral argument. Quite fascinating. In addition, something else fascinating happens while this case is pending at the Supreme Court. And this is um, the actress, Angelina Jolie. She writes a very influential op-ed in the New York Times disclosing that she was diagnosed with a deleterious PRCA mutation. And as a result, she underwent a radical bilateral mastectomy to remove her breast tissue um, to prevent herself from getting cancer. And as a rich movie star, she could afford to pay for this. But she mentions in this op-ed that it's an expensive test. Not everybody can afford it because of these patents. Um, and this happens just a few weeks after the oral argument. And so what happens at the Supreme Court? This is a spoiler. I, I still, you can still read the book. But um, the court reaches a unanimous decision, which, if you know anything about the US Supreme Court, is somewhat unusual. Um, but they are unanimous in this case. Um, and the winner is the new Solicitor General, Don Verrilli, who basically adopts that compromise position that Neil Katyal developed. Justice Clarence Thomas uh, writes a short opinion uh, for the court, basically, again, adopting this compromise of the Solicitor General. The naturally occurring DNA in the body is not patentable. It's a product of nature. If you were to uh, you know, create a construct that only included the coding pieces of it, sure, that might be patentable. And Myriad doesn't do this, uh, by the way. right? To, to create a diagnostic test, you need to sequence and reproduce the entire 80,000 uh, bases of the DNA. Only a drug company would, would make this construct. But you know, that doesn't matter. Uh, for the legal principles. Myriad loses. Um, and so what does this mean? There's an immediate impact, right? Literally, the day after this case comes out, um, competitors start to advertise. This is an actual ad from Ambry Genetics, a large diagnostic testing company, um, that now offers, like one day later, PRCA testing, half the price of the, uh, the Myriad test. And today, of course, if you subscribe to 23andMe or one of these personal genomic services for $125, you can find out whether you have a deleterious PRCA mutation or like 15 other uh, different types of health-related um, genetic defects that you couldn't when these were all patented. And the other thing about this case is, this is the very interesting thing about litigation advocacy. The US Supreme Court has ruled on this, and so now this decision is binding throughout the United States, everywhere, right? So not just Pennsylvania, not just New Jersey, this is everywhere in the United States. And it covers not just the myriad PRCA patents, but all of the patents that covered human genes. So University of Michigan's patents on CFTR also revoked. Um, I mean, they're still on the books at the patent office, but, but they are not enforceable because of this. Okay. So what about that? Um, of course, many people were not happy with the way that it came out. Um, it was criticized heavily. Not enough patents are being issued now. Um, natural, natural complaint, right? Um, and so, you know, constituents uh, complain and Congress listens, right? And so we do have legislation, and really, for many years, 
congressmen, senators have been proposing legislation to attempt to reverse this case. Um, Senator Tillis, uh, Republican from North Carolina last year, introduced a bill that would effectively um, reverse the Myriad decision explicitly, um, saying that purified and isolated DNA, it is patentable, and Congress can do this. This is the way our, you know, checks and balances work in the three, um, you know, the three-pronged system, executive, legislative, judicial branches of government. The Supreme Court can interpret statutes, and its interpretation is binding, but if the Congress doesn't like the interpretation, they can change the statute. Um, as long as they're not doing something unconstitutional, right, they can change these statutes. And so this is, this is where we are today. Um, what happens next is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, it'll be interesting. And these are still live issues, right? Even though the Myriad case was now resolved 10 years ago, um, this is still happening. So I am a law professor. You know, most of what I write is pretty boring. Here's in law journals. Um, very few people read it. Uh, but this case was different, right? This, this book was different. I, I interviewed almost 100 people um, to tell this story. And I really am just the messenger of the stories of, of, of all of these people on both sides. I moved to Utah and began to work at the University of Utah while I was writing this book. But this was happening. I, I didn't moved there for the purpose of writing this book. It was complete coincidence, um, but it gave, me act, it gave me access to the scientists and the business people um, and the lawyers who worked for Myriad um, to hear their perspective. And they weren't evil. Uh, these people, most of them thought that their company was doing good. It was diagnosing breast cancer, was saving lives, and it just was um, to some degree. If anyone's really the bad guy in this story, look to the insurance industry um, in the United States. Um, but anyway, they were very helpful to me, and I, I owe them. Uh, really, this book is owed to uh, to them. Without them, this would be a boring a legal monograph. Um, and uh, that's really all that I have. There's a lot more. Um, I, I, I commend the book to you, um, and really happy to take your question comments, or uh, suggestions. We can talk. With the question time, feel free to ask a uh, uh, new line. Am I hurt? I think, I'm yeah. Should we, well, should we get the microphone to the person no, asking? I think it's catching from the microphone. Okay, so that's enough. All right. Nice to see you again. You're a repeat customer. Thank you for the opportunity. And the time, by the way. And as you said, it's a long time. I will wait. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> but maybe. Uh, but actually, I have. Uh, first of all, about uh, and in one of your latest articles, I think one, you wrote that no research is in the private sector has the benefit of but pure research that is conducted in the so in my view, what if I under so my question is, why do you feel it? Uh, uh, and second, I'm a little I want to ask you about your opinion. Uh, uh, why, why haven't it been or even, uh, or even labeled uh, and not only a device for a drug, or even a process, method? For example, in this case, we have a CRCA chip, right? But we also have a drug catalytic test, right? Like a mm -hmm. drug. So, only patent test, so it allows you to research by university, uh, which you mentioned, or do not. Right? Uh, and actually, okay. Do you think, in your opinion, this DNA, DNA, I 
And uh, thank you for reading, you know, my boring articles also. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, so the research exemption, you know, well, what is, what is this? It, there's an idea, well, actually, so many scientists have the idea that if they do experiments in their laboratory, uh, they have no worries about patents, right? They can do this. And, that, that used to be true, and that's true in some countries more than others. The UK has a pretty good research. In the US, not so much. It's been limited very much. Um, and, and the case, the big case on the research exemption was a, a case called Maddie versus Duke, uh, Duke University, um, in which uh, this, again, many cases, they always arise from like some bad employment relationship. Professor Maddie, studied lasers at Duke University. Then he left to go to some other university that gives him a better deal. But of course, the equipment is owned by Duke. Um, and so he sues the people still at Duke um, for using his equipment, uh, which is all patented, um, uh, because it infringes his patent. And Duke says, no, 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 this is pure academic research. We, we should not have any liability for patent infringement. And the court, the, the patent court, right, the Court of Appeals says, no, Duke, you're liable. Look, Duke University, they have all these patents. They license patents to drug companies. They make all of this money. They get money from the federal government grants. Duke University has a budget of a, like a billion dollars a year. This is a big business. And so research exemption, if there is one, it only, I, I forget the words, it's very funny, it only, Applies really to pure, you know, philosophical inquiry. Like the guy in his basement who just for fun is like playing around, making. So university laboratories now they have to worry um, about this, except if you're experimenting for an FDA-approved drug, right, or device. That's the one statutory exemption. Well, it's a weird exemption. Myriad allowed, they made a patent pledge. Um, if <laughs> you remember my last lecture here in Postman, um, they made a patent pledge that Myriad would not sue academic researchers for studying the BRCA gene. And they didn't. They did not do this. They required the researchers, again, they could not tell patients what their results were, but for the academic research, they could do it. But Myriad did not have to do that. They could have sued for patent um, Anyway, so research example. Um, I don't know if that even answered your question. Okay, so why patent the gene instead of just the test or the drug? Well, because the theory is to patent everything that you can patent, right? This is the, the, the patent lawyer's approach. If I can get a, I, I will patent the drug. I will patent the test. I will patent the box that the test comes in. But I also, the best thing is to patent the gene. That's the composition of matter. Because this is the broadest patent of all. Remember, Myriad, Myriad's true discovery, which again, other labs would have discovered like one week or something later, their true discovery was the mutations that are affiliated with breast cancer and ovarian disease. Myriad wasn't a drug company. They, they had no, to, to make a drug, you must you be much bigger. A startup cannot be a drug company. A startup can be a diagnostics company, right? But they can't be a drug company. If they patent the gene, then they also, their patent controls any drug that uses or targets the BRCA gene. This, they license to Eli Lilly, right? Long before they discovered anything. This is why Lilly gave them millions of dollars. 
Because Lily bought the rights in advance to the love rights in the RCA. Um, and that, you know, if you think $3,000 is much for a diagnostic test, right? I mean, the drug would be $300,000. Um, the real money, billions of dollars come from the drugs. And, but, but the owner of the patent on the gene controls not just this little diagnostic test, but everything downstream also. So Myriad, there were three businesses they thought they could make from this. The diagnostic test, which they planned to make their business. And this was a big business. Myriad, revenue was hundreds of billions of dollars a year, right? They're not a small company. That's their business. They licensed the rights to make a diagnostic test kit um, to another company. That, that never worked. Um, the kit, you know, that company, Hyperdon, paid them money for it, but it, it, the test was too complicated to make into, like, a, the, the COVID test that they put in the drugstore. Um, and then Lilly, they got all the therapeutic rights. And the gene never worked out as a cancer drug, right? The, the, and I, I can tell you from biology why this was, right? It's a, it's a very unstable gene. This is why it took four years to discover the sequence. A lot of shifting around, a lot of instability, a lot of repetitions, and so it, it was not a good, not good drug target. So Lily, you know, they make these companies, they place bets. Um, this bet did not pay off for Lily, did not pay off for Hyperdon, but Myriad, yes. So that's why the patent the gene. What do I think about the distinction between GDNA and cDNA? Now, this distinction made no sense. Um, because if you're saying that the, I mean, on the one hand, the Supreme Court says, okay, Federal Circuit, you make this, the, the Federal Circuit distinction between, you know, the formality, like the, the chemical, um, the chemical nature of, of the gene of the molecule is irrelevant. We're going to forget about chemical structure. That's not what DNA is about. I, I agree with that. Okay. But then chemical structure does matter when you just have the, uh, you know, when, when you're allowing a patent on just the, the exome, right, the cDNA part. And so on one hand, the Supreme Court says chemical structure doesn't matter when we're talking about the, you know, the molecules, that make it, but chemical structure does matter when you're talking about whether it's a cDNA or a genomic DNA. So I, I think it doesn't make that much sense, but, you know, what can you do? Um, I'm not the first uh, to, to, to make this. Up. Scientists look at this opinion and they scratch their head. How does this? How does this make it? Um, so why did I write this book? Well, you know, I wasn't sure I would write it. I, I, I had followed this case and this saga from, you know, long before the case was. But then, to me, it was just like any other interesting patent law topic. There are lots of them, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> and. Um, but then I started to talk to people, people from advocacy organizations. There's an advocacy organization called FORCE, Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. Um, they're the support group for people with BRCA positive um, mutation. And you know, even if you're healthy, getting this diagnosis is a terrible, devastating piece of news. And you really do need support to decide if you should get these surgeries, how this will affect your ability to bear children, especially the ovarian cancer. So it's a very good support group, and I met many of these people. We had a focus group um, in Washington where I heard some of what they were going through, and I, I realized, like, this is a patent case, but unlike, you know, 5G, you know, chips or automobile brakes or, you know, some other technology that, that we have these patents, this was a patent case, but about really technology really important to people, and there were a lot of people's stories here, and, and I thought I should follow this. And, and then the more people I spoke to, the more, you know, you, you lift the rock, and underneath there's a lot of worms, but also five more rocks um, that you can lift up. And, and as, as, especially as I started to interview the people from the government, I realized, like, what a big deal this was in the Obama White House, how much controversy there was. And that story, that had never been told. No one... No one knew the story because the government people were quiet. I did, I, I submitted like a dozen Freedom of Information Act FOIA requests to different government agencies. 
including the University of Utah, my own university, uh, which uh, didn't go so well. Um, but, um, you know, the, the more I, people I talked to, the more that I thought about it, the more I thought this would be a story that should not just be locked up in the academic journals, right? That ordinary people deserve to know something about how our legal system works um, and how these types of cases can, can be brought, how the law can be changed you know, by people who are outsiders. I, I was fascinated by the idea that the ACLU, they were not part of the patent establishment. People thought they were crazy, they were amateurs, but they were really very smart. And um, outsiders can do this, and litigation is the way to do it, right? The lobbyists, you know, Congress, you, lobbyists charge huge amounts of money, they make huge and they're very effective. Um, but the court system, you don't need to hire a lobbying firm in Washington, um, you know, determined lawyers can, can I thought this was a nice thing for, um, you know, for lawyers who are interested. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for this extraordinary story. And uh, I have actually two questions. And the first one might be, um, sorry if it's uh, if the answer is obvious. For you, maybe, but you, you mentioned that this uh, uh, this Italy uh, bought the uh, drug rights yeah. for the for the for this. You know, and you, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, the patent covers as well uh, the well, drugs that targets the gene, right? The, this gene. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm I'm not sure if I understand uh, what what exactly they. From Miria, is is it uh, like the right to use the gene to further research on uh, the drug development, or the, what is it exactly? So a bit, a bit into specifics. Of yes, this. absolutely. So, so the theory, and again, the drug development never worked. But the theory is, Myriad owns the gene. Everything you can do with the gene. So, for a drug. So uh, an anti-cancer drug, tumor um, agent, often it will target part of the tumor, right? It'll target some area on, on the gene to stop the tumor or, or something. Or maybe it'll repair the defect in the gene. But for, to make that drug, you need to reproduce some DNA that's in the gene um, so that it's attractive or, you know, the opposite of complementary side of A's and T's and G's and C's are, they, they attract. Um, so you need to do that in your drug. But you can't um, if somebody owns that sequence. Um, so, so again, that's why owning the composition of matter patent on the gene is so powerful. Because anything that you want to do that relates to that gene, you really need um, permission from the owner of the gene. Thanks. And, and uh, my second question actually goes back to what you said about this early stage of uh, ACLU uh, de developing the case. Uh, I'm curious, how does it work when they uh, when they research on who the plaintiff or who involved in the process? Is, is it any? Are there any NDAs going on there? Is it, uh, how does it? What's the legal? Um, What's the lawyer's job within that early stage? Uh, if I'm the one who's working for the ACLU, should I, you know, uh, make a publication on this, or should I go like researching the individuals and making them sign the NDAs? How does that work? Oh yes. Yeah. So this is a good, good question. So the um, in this case, the people who were responsible for Gathering the plaintiffs were Tanya Simoncelli, the science advisor, and Sandra Park, the young um, women's rights uh, lawyer. That, that was their job. Chris Hansen, he was developing the legal theory, the constitutional theory, right? They were out in the field and they just brainstormed first, right? They, like, who might be injured by, by this patent? Um, they worked with scientists, right? Very early on, they, they had to meet scientists who could help them understand the science. 
And some of those scientists um, became plaintiffs and introduced them to others. Um, that's how they met the genetic counselors. The genetic counselor at Yale named Ellen Matloff was one of their key people. She was a plaintiff herself, but also because genetic counselors, their job is to counsel these people with genetic diseases or genetic defects. They had access to that patient community. Um, and so Matloff was able, through listservs, she was able to put out the word, hey, you are, have a BRCA mutation or wanted to get a BRCA test but couldn't do it, you know, contact me and I'll put you in touch. There, there are some people looking into, uh, looking into this issue. And so that's, that's how it happened. Um, it, um, it was very informal, right? And then it involved one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, especially the women, the patients. They're, they were very ordinary people, right? They're not, like, yes, the scientists and the genetic counselors and the advocates, they, they all knew about litigation, but, but the six women were, were required some convincing. And, um, you know, Sandra Park and Tanya Sinicelli were very good at that. And they, they became personally very close to uh, to, to And, um, you know, I think that's a very, uh, that to me was a very touching piece of, of this. NDAs, no, there really weren't NDAs. You know, this is not corporate. Um, the, the lawyers, of course, are bound by a duty of confidentiality to their, their client, right? So, the, and the ACLU lawyers, they, they were extremely careful. They were very strict. They would not tell me anything um, privileged um, unless I went to the patients themselves and, and interviewed them. And the patients then could tell me. Um, and I, I did that, but not all the patients would even want to, to talk with me. I think, I mean, sadly, one of them died before I worked on this project. Um, but of the five who were living, I, I, I Eventually, was able to talk to four, um, and you know that was uh, very moving uh, for me. But but again, because it's not a commercial case, they really were no NDAs. Uh, they could they could talk about whatever they. Wanted. I was I was rather curious if uh, there there was wasn't any risk of those people being asked uh, by ACLU to simply go to the media and start to. Work with the other side of the litigation. Uh, yes, yes, and of course, Myriad thought about that. Um, one of the principal plaintiffs, this woman, uh, Lisbeth Siriani, um, in, in Boston, who was unable to get tested because she was on you know, the public assistance, um, our, our, our Medicaid program, which would not pay for the tests, and she Big. She tried to get Myriad to, to you know, give the test, and, and then like uh, uh, she got breast cancer. She you know was in chemotherapy and in recovery. Finally, um, so she becomes a plaintiff, and then when Myriad sees her name on the list of plaintiffs, then they call her and say, "Hey, good news! We we now have a program for Massachusetts where you can get a free test if you have low income," and uh, and and even though she already has cancer, she already has surgery, this is important because she has daughters, right? And so she does want to get the test, um, but, but she says, no, it's like, forget it, I'm still a plaintiff, no way am I working with you. And most of the people, they, they had no desire um, to work with her. But Myriad had plenty of scientists and doctors on her side, right? they, and genetic counselors, they were represented by, by Jones Day, one of the biggest, most powerful law firms in, in the U.S., um, lots of Supreme Court cases, and they, they did whatever was possible. To yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you for the great lecture. I really envy you because write a legal book that is a book about stories of people. So I do hope uh, it will be a chance for me one day. So it's a, it's a, it must be a great book. I haven't read, I will. 
Um, but after hearing all, you heard all these stories, you said you interviewed a lot of people. How does that affect your uh, post academic work? And I wanted to ask what is your legal opinion for a decision and the subsequent bill that you have just briefly presented? Yes, yes. So, you know, I, and this is a public record, I, I joined an amicus brief in support of the ACLU's case. Uh, my, so my sympathies were with the ACLU um, to, uh, to start with. Um, I think the Supreme Court, you know, they mostly got it right. <laughs> I was very glad of the decision. I think the CDNA uh, thing, the DFA, I mean, it, uh, it didn't hurt that much. Um, and I, I also, by the way, think the diagnostics industry, it's doing just fine. This, this, this case did not destroy this industry. Myriad itself, they keep opening new buildings in, in, in their campus. They now have like 10 buildings. They're, the company is fine. Um, and Americans can get any diagnostic test they want. Um, so it's not like this has destroyed the diagnostic. I think that the legislation is very problematic. Um, not for the human genes, right? So the human genome was sequenced you know, almost fully sequenced by 2003 with the Human Genome Project. In 2021, like the very last final pieces were, were put together. Um, nobody's patenting what we call, you know, the baseline wild type human genome anymore in the public. Um, what you could patent are new variants that we didn't know about that have function that we didn't know about. So COVID immunity. Suppose we find there's some family, these people, they went to every rock concert, every party with no masks and did many risky things, and no one ever got uh, COVID-19 during three years. You know, maybe there's something uh, that these people, and we test them, we discover this is the COVID resistance mutation. We want to make a drug or a vaccine out of it. Um, that's new, right? That couldn't have been patented. <clears throat> and so the Tillis bill would change, something like that. The other big thing that I, it's a bit technical, so I didn't cover it uh, today, but where we are continuing to find new genomes every year is not in humans, but in pathogens, in, in bacteria, uh, infections, and viruses, right? So the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, it was first sequenced, right, in late December 2019, for the first time. It was new. It just, it just appeared out of you know, mutations to other coronaviruses. And the Chinese scientists who did the sequence, they did not seek a patent. Um, I think primarily because of this case and the practice in the scientific community has been now, you know, we no longer are going to try to get patents on these pathogen genomes. But before this, they did. So if you look back at the history of SARS or MERS, right, the two previous coronavirus outbreaks um, in the, uh, the sort of the early 2000s, they did get patents. The, the, the group that discovered them was the Erasmus um, Institute in the Netherlands. Um, viral genomes. Also. Um, and this caused problems, right? Erasmus caused a lot of controversy with their patent. Um, and they claim, oh, but we'll never enforce this patent, you know, trust us. But, and that's fine if you trust them. Um, but, you know, my university, you know, says trust us also. And look what they, they licensed it to, uh, to Myriad. So I think that we're in a pretty good position with no patents on SARS-CoV-2. We got vaccines like incredibly fast, right? And again, I'm not defending the vaccine industry with all these problems about distribution and equitable use of the vaccines, but at least they were developed um, very fast. And same thing with diagnostic tests. They were, within two weeks, we had the first diagnostic test for, for this outbreak. I think, that would, I think that would be slowed down. I think it would be harmed if we went back. And I, I, I don't think that Tillis people are thinking about this carefully enough, right? So we'll see. There, there should be hearings next year. 
uh, about these bills, and you know, I, I definitely plan to volunteer <laughs> to speak these. Bartek wrote, I think, a piece about one of those cases that you also covered in your book, Bilski, if I remember well. Yeah, Bilski. Ah! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that was the storyline behind the software patenting uh, directive, yeah. back in 2005. Yes, yes. So there's a... Uh, so Myriad was one of four patent eligibility cases heard by the U.S. Supreme Court between 2010 and 2014. So it's Bilski... Uh, Mayo versus Prometheus, Myriad, and Alice versus CLS Bank. And I, I touch on them in, in, in the book. Each of them is a fascinating story. Bilski, you know, this is this. Even the patent office didn't give them their patent, right? I mean, Myriad, the patent office, they gave them the patent and they were very much behind it. Bilski, this was two energy traders, two Enron guys, or Enron type guys, who were trying to patent a way. <laughs> They, they patented a method for, for uh, evening out your utility, your utility bill, right? Because when, I don't know how you pay for heating and electricity here, but in the U.S. you get a bill every month. And in the summer, if, in Texas, you pay $300 a month for air conditioning. And in the winter, you pay $50 because you don't use much electricity. But they wanted to find a way to even it out so people could pay $125 every month um, so they had a reliable, you know, because people are poor budgeters, right? And so in the winter, they don't pay their bill um, because they didn't save the money back from the summer. Um, and so they patented this method of creating an even, you know, the algorithm for figuring out how much your energy bill should be if you pay the same amount every month. And they, they tried to patent this, and the patent office didn't allow it. But it became a Supreme Court case because they kept pushing uh, to see if they could get a patent. Interesting story. And Alice, a software-related invention. I, the, uh, there were big repercussions of, of these cases, right? This quartet of eligibility decisions. I mean, the, so the Senator Tillis and the people who back him, they don't like any of these decisions, right? They would say, patent it all. Just patent all of it. Like, why not? And then see what happens. Um, the business community will, will sort it out. And, you know, that, that's, that's one view. Um, yeah, so I, there, there, there's a lot, there, there are many layers to this, and this is just one facet of a bigger debate going on around the world, right? Because, as you said, Europe also is, wrestles with these same, these same issues. The, the, the G patents are much narrower in Europe, right? Myriad, of course, got patents in Europe and Australia and Canada and plenty of other places. Um, and they vary. The different countries have just different results. In, in, in the, the European patents are much narrower. They only relate to the method of diagnosing a higher risk of breast cancer um, based on the presence of these mutations. Right? They're not the composition of matter patents. Um, you know, Australia had broader patents, but invalidated some of them. In Canada, everyone ignored the patents, and, and Myriad never brought a lawsuit in Canada. I guess the market was just, didn't make it worth it. Um, so yeah, it, it, the international story is also quite fascinating um, around, around this issue. I don't know what happened in Poland. Two. Were there patents? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> just one, I thought about a comment. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Uh, this one about Chris Hansen, which was the chief litigator. The interesting thing is that uh, if you read the book, he is the guy who got it right from the very start. Uh, the, the patents on genes were I mean, outrageous for him, and nonsense. This was his intuition. Intuition, yeah. but he had no patent law experience. Neither did he have any science. Uh, has not taken any courses in, uh, in his undergraduate school, etc. And he got it right from the very start. Whereas the patent community never got it right. <laughs> and uh, well, they still claim that they're right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and just 
that one of the arguments that is raised often against specialized patent courts, <coughs> because once you're in a specialized court, yeah, that was also raised against the, the Polish courts, because we introduced them. And uh, the argument goes that, that if you, you are into a specialized court for a very long period of time, you become patent-centric. And yeah. All you think about is, uh, is patents. And, uh, and uh, maybe that is, maybe sometimes it's better to have people who on the outside look at this. And then they, sometimes their opinion is much better than, than the insiders. Yeah. Who become too technical about it. No, you're, you're totally right. And, you know, even in the academy, you know, so the ACLU people, they went around, they asked, professors, you know, of patent law, what they thought about this case. And most of them thought, no, no, that's not a good, you're, you'll lose this case, you know, I mean, we, we appreciate, we, we're, we're behind you, you know, we, we understand these issues, but the patents, they won't last much longer, you know, most of Myriad's patents would have expired by 2017, and this is black letter law. The patent office has been doing this a long time, so don't don't bother. Um, and you know, this is from fairly left leaning patent scholars, um, who again, we have all we all grew up with this, and it just was part of the environment. And it, it really took an outsider to look and say, "What are you kidding me? That this is actually happening?" Yeah, it was very strange. One more comment that I wanted to make. You, you said uh, a few words about uh, these uh, clerks. Uh, this is something, it's a, I, I'm not sure if you recognize it, but it's extremely prestigious in the US to be a cleric, to a judge. And uh, uh, it, our, uh, our lawyers, after finishing law school, become clerks now. Oh, they do? Yes. Uh, uh, there is a possibility so that they assist judges in finding the oh, case good. law and preparing the opinions. Oh, so it's the same. Yeah, and I had two, two of them from the Poznan uh, Patent Court, the uh, uh, Poznan IP Court, uh, that I followed them on LinkedIn, because they do show where the, where the case law goes, how the court approaches, mm -hmm. how it begins to apply certain institutions once they're new. Uh, and I think that uh, probably you follow them as well, because they also uh, take part in, in the meetings, IP meetings yeah. that you organize, they are excellent. Uh, they give a lot of insights. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, uh, maybe I have a bias because uh, I have a lot of respect for people who clerk in the US, uh, and, uh, but, but, uh, but I think that it's, it's becoming, uh, I mean, at least for me, I do value their opinions. They're, they're very, uh, I think they have a lot of interesting uh, uh, things to say about application of the law. So, so maybe, probably it will take time before this becomes as prestigious as it is in the U.S. But, uh, but, but maybe, maybe yes, maybe yes. But if, if I may add, uh, that's completely new, and you're right. In, in our meetings, uh, we, we organize some meetings with IP center lawyers uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, uh, there was this uh, a clerk from Poznan. She's amazing, and uh, what uh, what they are doing is also uh, uh, this one from the, uh, our family office. She, she started she started to work with the private firms recently. Uh, it's not the patent office. What they are doing is they are, like you mentioned, they pr provide insights, and before that, uh, and they provide it on LinkedIn, which is it's like social media. That's, yeah. that's perfect. Um, <coughs> very fast to, to, to get them. Uh, while before we only had those uh, verdicts, right? Ah. You, you, when, when you read those verdicts, they are like, all the same. If, if, you, if you're into trademark uh, law, it's, it's going to be basically all the same. It, 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 there's not much of, uh, uh, there's a lot of this uh, uh, lawyerish discourse in it without the insights, without, ah. the, without the actual background of this, of this case. I mean, it is only the background is described in, in the verdicts, but not the, the real issues yeah. that lie behind it. So, yeah, it's, 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 
I think it's the uh, yeah. new uh, way to discover things in our uh, industry. I, if you're law students and this is available to you, I highly recommend it. Um, any court, even if it doesn't do intellectual property. I, I, I clerked at, uh, we have a federal and state system. Um, I, 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 my clerkship was, um, I clerked for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas, um, which uh, was a fascinating year. <laughs> Just, yeah, I'll never forget it. Um, and uh, I keep in touch with my judge. Um, I was last year just elected to the American Law Institute, um, which is uh, something for lawyers. And uh, it was very nice. My, my judge, who's also a member of the ALI, welcomed me to, uh, to the American Law Institute. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, I would recommend it if this is available uh, to you. Yeah, you should read the book also because there are career, uh, career patterns that you might follow. Very interesting career path, like like Dan Ravisher, <laughs> a patent attorney. Uh, uh, worth 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 doing this. Uh, there are many career pa uh, paths for lawyers. So so for, for that, uh, for, this is also one of those layers in George's book that is worth uh, uh, looking at uh, when you're starting your career. All right, I, th I think we certainly deserve lunch right oh, now. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Well, I I, uh, I agree. Thank you very much. It's, uh, uh, I'm very happy that we do have audience on site and that we have had uh, people, uh, a lot of students online as well, from also from other departments. Uh, uh, George, thank you very much for taking the time. Of course. It's, it's been an honor for us. Um, <coughs> and uh, we have some events planned for the future. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, if you're thinking about the book, it's available in paperback, much less expensive. Awesome. And it's on I think it's like five euros. It's yeah. pretty cheap. And it's on Amazon or eBay or whatever. <laughs> yeah. They deliver it really fast right now. <laughs> I, I, I tried. I got it really fast. Uh, so the, the ebook edition is also available. Ebook is available. Yeah. And, and, and just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of joking. I, 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 my goal is not to sell you know, copies of this book. Uh, but but of, of the royalties, I do make some small royalty from this, this book, and half of all of my proceeds I, I donate to FORCE, this, um, you know, this support group for the BRCA-positive people, um, because without them I could never have wrote it. So, uh, so you could copy, you get a copy of this okay. book. Thank you. Okay, very thank much. you. Thank, thank you, you for you. having me. Thank you for your presence, and welcome for the next events that we certainly yes. hold here. <clears throat>